I'm Robin. I'm the adult and teen services librarian at the Hercules branch. And we have Scott Chavez here from the Contra Costa Crisis Center, and he's going to be giving a presentation today. And with that, I will let Scott take it away. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for inviting us to present uh, today and then again in May uh, on the topic of grief and stress and loss, uh, particularly, I mean, in general, and then particularly in the context of the COVID pandemic. So let me share my screen. Uh, so here is uh, the Contra Costa Crisis Center. Let me move to the next slide. And I just want to point out, uh, I'll show it in just a moment uh, what we will do today during our time together. I want to talk a little bit about the services of the Contra Costa Crisis Center so that for yourselves or anyone that you know how you can connect to the services. So certainly you can reach us by dialing 211 here in Contra Costa. If you and your phone are in Contra Costa County and you dial 211, your call will come to us. If you drive just a little further away and you're in Berkeley and you dial 211, then your call would go to the Alameda County 211 service, which is a little different than ours. We have various different services, and I'll point that out. So we also have an 800 number, 800-833-2900. We can also receive texts and send text, uh, text the word HOPE to 20121. Our main services, as you can see right here on this card, a big picture of the card, crisis and suicide support, our hotlines and helplines. We have information and referral, and we'll go over this more in a moment, for services in the community. And then we also have grief counseling, which is uh, part of perhaps why I've been invited today to talk about this topic. All right, so what I want to do is today talk about a little bit more detail of the services and then to talk about stress and coping, loss and grief, signs of stress and anxiety, taking care of yourself, and then what might help regarding depression or anxiety, what might help regarding grief. As time might allow, again, you heard that we'll go until 2.45-ish, I guess, and then we'll turn off the recording and allow you to share whatever you'd like to share without it being recorded. We might take a brief pause here or there if you wanted to offer any thoughts. We'll have to see how that goes related to the timing and the logistics. For those that would want to share something that would then become a part of the recording. So obviously you can make a decision for whatever you'd like to, however you'd like to participate. So as time might allow, we could have some discussion or reflection related to the effects of COVID on ourselves and in our community. What are protective factors? And then again, I don't know what, how the timing will be. I included here in the PowerPoint just some basic steps for suicide prevention since we are here a crisis and suicide prevention hotline and center. All right. Now, so launching into just a little bit about the crisis center itself. So we have 24-hour crisis lines. I'll say a little bit more about that. Here's the overview. 24-hour 211 in-phone referral. Just highlighting some of what that's about now. And we know about resources in the community, including, especially right now, COVID-19 resources. So, for example, coming up very soon, very importantly, eviction prevention services and agencies that try to help people. We are also part of Homeless Coordinated Entry, and we also have a contract related to Help Me Grow families with young children age zero to five to know about developmental milestones and to recognize if there are any needs that are developing. We have grief groups and a new stress group, and I'll point that out in just a moment, community outreach and training, and I'll say more about more training coming up in the upcoming weeks and couple of months. All right, so I'd like to give you an overview of the variety of calls that come into our call center. Certainly on the 211 info and referral line, it's about resources in the community, and we'll see a little bit more about that. Then calls related to the topic of suicide, when the individual has thoughts of suicide, 
and they can certainly call in. Or if someone is concerned about someone else, then they can call in and we will talk with them about how they can be helpful and also maybe get some sense of the level of risk of the other person that they're concerned about. Now, we are crisis and grief, and therefore you don't need to have thoughts of suicide in order to call us. So just whatever it is that's going on in life and you want someone to talk to any time of the day or night, any day of the week, any day of the year, to call us on our lines. Or it could be either about yourself or you're concerned about someone else. And then there are folks who call in, eh, it depends on the individual and depends on the need in any given moment, those who call in for continuing support. So all of this variety of the kinds of calls that we take at our call center here in Contra Costa, and in fact, the office is in Walnut Creek. All right, so looking at the crisis and suicide hotline, uh, all you got to do, as I've already said, is dial in 211 or 1-800-833-2900, text the word HOPE to 20121. We do have a grief hotline, a separate 800 number, although we're not announcing it, but it still works. Now we're just telling people that they can call 211 here in Contra Costa. We're also a part of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So sometimes when people Google the topic of suicide, that will come up more quickly than our own number, local number. But we have our own local numbers that you just saw, and then we're also part of the line. The National Suicide Line does not have its own call center. It uses centers from around the nation. And there are several centers here in the Bay Area that are a part of the network. 211 in phone referral is about knowing about health and social services in the community. Again, people just call in, text in, and there's a database, and I think I'll show you a picture of it in just a moment that anyone can access 211cc.org. 211 is also about knowing about resources in a time of disaster, like now. Uh, so, COVID, we have we know what's available to help people in this time of COVID. That's very important, very valuable. Food, rental tenants' rights, uh, utility assistance, eviction prevention. Right here, if you can take a quick look at this, you can see the wide variety of kinds of services that are in any 211 database and in our 211 database. So I already mentioned COVID-19, rental payment, eviction prevention, tenants' rights, PG&E payment assistance, low-cost housing referrals. Regrettably, there are never enough in our Bay Area. Food, food pantries, meals, mental health services, physical health in terms of doctors and clinics and dental care, substance abuse services, re-entry assistance for those who had been in jail or prison, free tax preparation, low-cost high-speed internet, education, job training, parenting support. Oh, by the way, back to education, libraries, at least some general numbers listed in the 211 database, parenting support, services for seniors, services for those with disabilities, services for those experiencing domestic violence, relationship violence, sexual assault, rape, LGBTQQ support services. So that's part of the great variety. Here is what it looks like if you go there now to 211cc.org and you can click on the picture or there's a search bar down below. Uh, I did mention that we have grief groups and we also have a COVID stress support group. And in fact, I was involved with that. So that has helped to give insight into what are the struggles of at least some people uh, these days in the midst of the COVID pandemic. If you'd like to join, just dial 211 and, and uh, get connected to our grief program manager. I mentioned that we have trainings coming up where they're ongoing. We have one next week uh, related to suicide prevention, risk assessment, intervention. We've got a one-hour training, four-hour training, six-hour training. You just need one of them. Otherwise, they, they, uh, you don't need to go to all of them. And you can sign up. It's free uh, right now in April, May, and June because of funding through the Mental Health Services Act Office of our county. Here are outreach cards. When people are in person, they can see them more, and the libraries have been very helpful to us in distributing these to people, letting people know that they can call 211. We are a team of volunteers and staff, and people can help out in various ways, and we have monthly informational meetings just to find out how to become a volunteer with us, mostly here at our office in Walnut Creek. Uh, but anyway, take a look on our website. 
uh, links to videos. I can send this to you all or you can email me back. Uh, if we have time, we might look at one of these. I'm not sure, again, how the timing will go. Uh, particularly one of these that features our grief program. This is also available through our website, buried deep within our web blog, our blog. <laughs> all right. So with that, uh, I'll just pause and see. I don't know if there was anything in the chat. I could take a look if there were any questions about the services. Otherwise, we'll move on to the grief and stress and loss. Yeah, Scott, there was just one question about if we could get the, a copy of the slides. Um, Absolutely. I yes, I can send that to you. Shall I send it to you and then you can send it out? Yes, that would cool. be great. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Great. Well, that was easy. All right. So let's then march on grief, stress, and loss. What I'd like to talk about here, the grief and loss, and then throw in the stress, <laughs> that various types of loss, I find this helpful. So this is just some of the topics I hope to cover in our time here. Symptoms of normal grief, grief wheel, wardens for tasks of grieving, then a simple model of the grieving process stress and taking care of yourself. And again, there's some extra uh, topics that I can throw in if we still have time. So here are general categories of losses. It's helpful to take a look at this so that grieving can be more than the grief after someone has died. There, is, there are various kinds of grief and various types of losses. So these are some categories, and we're going to take a look at some specific examples in each of these categories. So concrete losses, developmental losses, abstract losses, losses of people, loss of self. And by the way, if anyone wants to add anything, another way to do that would be to put that in the chat, and then perhaps Robin would be able to alert us and let us know that there's uh, something to add. So let's take a look here at concrete losses, personal possessions, money, a pet, a job, a car, a home, a jewelry, jewelry. So perhaps nowadays in terms of COVID, maybe there's been loss of money, maybe for some people loss of home or regrettably, hopefully avoidably, but maybe soon then people will be dealing with that issue of how to be able to stay in their home. Uh, certainly loss of job has probably affected a number of people. Developmental losses, loss of fertility, loss of mobility, loss of balance, loss of vision, loss of hearing, loss of hair, loss of hair color, Loss of skin tone, loss of memory, cognition, cognition, the ability to think. Now, here are loss of something for now that I was thinking about during this time of COVID. Loss of developmental milestones, loss of birthday celebrations, anniversaries, proms, graduations, funerals. And maybe there are others that we can think of that we have not been able to participate in due to this time of pandemic. Abstract losses, loss of dreams, loss of hope, loss of innocence, loss of faith, loss of trust, loss of a sense of security. Maybe that has happened during this time of pandemic. Loss of childhood, loss of youthfulness, loss of humor, loss of sense of humor, loss of femininity or virility, loss of reputation, loss of status, loss of position. Losses of people because someone has moved or due to divorce or separation, job loss, separated from the people that we were interacting with, retirement, same thing. Uh, loss of the job, it's, what is it, loss of people? Uh, loss of people by substance abuse, loss of people due to physical or emotional abuse, incarceration, social or physical distancing, absolutely during this time. 
So loss of socializing in person. Now, some people, well, here we are doing this by Zoom, but obviously there's still a loss of getting together in person, loss of a gathering, a larger gathering. Some people actually don't miss it <laughs> if they were not into larger gatherings anyway. But some people, a number of people, do miss it. Loss of going to concerts, sporting events, loss of going to religious or spiritual gatherings, even though some might be able to participate in these activities, either by TV or by Facebook or whatever, all of that. But there's still some loss due to this. Some people have spoken to me of their loss of touching other people, loss of hugging other people. So these are some of the kinds of losses. Loss of self through injury, through physical illness, through surgery, through pregnancy loss, through mental health concerns, a loss of one's sense of self. So that's our list of losses. I don't know if anyone had anything that uh, they wanted to echo or add to the list, Robin. Nothing, nothing yet. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I guess it was a comprehensive list. So let's take a look then at symptoms of normal grief. It's good to recognize that when we are grieving, whatever the loss, it will affect our emotions. I think we know that. I mean, we think of being sad, but we'll take a look at some of these aspects that there can be symptoms that affect us physically, symptoms that affect our cognition, our cognitive abilities, our ability to think, uh, or just affecting that. And then, of course, the behaviors, how we behave. So let me read some items here from lists of these symptoms of normal grief. So certainly, emotionally, there would be sadness, anger, actually. Not everyone always thinks of that, but that uh, whether loss of another person, there can be anger around that. And there can, and it emerges in the, sometimes in unexpected times or places. And also even now during the past year that any of this can emerge, the sadness or the anger. Guilt, self-reproach, anxiety, certainly there is anxiety due to the losses. There's also anxiety due to the, the virus itself, the coronavirus. Certainly loneliness, fatigue, helplessness, shock, uh, yearning, emancipation. That is, well, in terms of a loss of a death, some people actually feel free uh, because of that death. Relief, sometimes. Numbness. There can be that here now in this time of COVID. Physical sensations. Again, just a reminder, maybe we're aware of this, that the grieving, whether after a death or grieving all the losses of this past year, can affect any of us in physical ways. There may be something that we feel in our stomach or tightness in the chest or tightness in the throat. Oversensitivity to noise. And actually, for people who are stuck at home, so to speak, who had been or still may be, uh, well, when we were the sheltering in place or people not able to go to school or go to their usual workplace, more people have been together in their home and there may be a positive and there are struggles related to that. And so at any rate, oversensitivity to noise, people around each other a little bit more than usual feeling short of breath, weakness in the muscles, lack of energy, dry mouth. Those are some of the physical symptoms that might happen for various people that would be anticipated. Cognitive effects, disbelief, confusion, preoccupation, worry, and sometimes in terms of missing someone, maybe even hallucinations of the deceased. Behaviors. Sleep disturbances, appetite, either more or less, absent-minded behavior, social withdrawal. 
I think that's true nowadays, that some have perhaps withdrawn more than even the social distancing would require. Searching for meaning, I'm looking here at behaviors, searching and calling out for the deceased, sighing, restlessness, or over activity, crying. And so those are some of the symptoms. All right, let's move on. What to expect? Now, this grief wheel here is after the death of someone, but I think some of this can apply to any grieving, any loss. And so there is the loss you can see there. And then someone may be in shock, in amazement that they're not. Uh, and there can be, if you can read some of that writing there, the numbness, denial, outbursts, maybe weight loss affected. But in that time of shock, just not quite sure what's going on. And certainly perhaps for many of us a year ago, or most of us, that was the case. Protest and uh, against the loss. And then what I like to what I find helpful is that next stage of recognizing there's disorganization, whether after someone has died in our life, that that disorganizes our lives. And certainly the COVID loss, um, all of the sheltering in place and all of the many losses has disorganized our own personal lives, our family lives, our community life, our social, social at the societal level of loss, of, of disorganization. And the task is to continue on the path of reorganizing. And perhaps we are moving in that direction now in terms of our country of how do we reopen in the new context? And that will continue to evolve. And ideally, as you can see here on the grief wheel, one moves toward recovery. Sometimes there may be, as you can see there, the other direction of deterioration. And we're going to see a little later on another way of looking at that in terms of complicated grief. But a, de a deterioration, sometimes the, the shock and the protest and the disorganization doesn't move toward reorganizing, unfortunately. Now, we want to help people. And as individuals or a community and a society, obviously, to move toward that recovery. William Worden has these, has put it another way, of these four tasks of mourning. Now, this may be a little bit hard to read, but I'll read it to us. Task number one, to accept the reality of the loss. Task number two to work through the pain and the grief. Task number three, to adjust to an environment in which the deceased is missing. Now, obviously this is about someone who has died. For us, in terms of COVID, now maybe there have been some deaths involved, sadly, regrettably, whether due to other causes or due to COVID. And so this is relevant. But there's also the loss of whatever was previously the case when we've had many losses uh, and we must adjust to an environment that is new. That's how we can translate that for us. To find, and then task number four, to find an enduring connection with the deceased while embarking on a new life. So for us again to uh, find an enduring connection with what was and what can still be as we proceed into what will yet be. Uh, I'm just trying to modify this for our purposes of looking at not only just the grief of death, but the grief of this time and the losses of this time. So here they are just written out in a more clear way. Again, you'll receive this uh, PowerPoint. All right, the grieving process. Here is a simplified version that certainly after a loss, after the death, after a loss, there is that acute grief. There is, it is most intense at that time. Complicated grief is when the symptoms of acute grief last for years. Now, for us, we could say of this time of pandemic, that our time of loss has been extended and attenuated, I don't know if that's the right word, but at any rate, long lasting, 
it's not just one event, but it's been a year or more, and it, it's not over yet. It'll be interesting to see what happens as time goes by in any of us as individuals. And if symptoms of grief continue for years, then it would qualify as this as complicated grief. And it, it's a sign then that uh, there are needs that ideally we might address. Integrated grief, that is accepting the reality of the loss or the losses, resuming daily life activities as much as possible, and learning how to cope even while missing the deceased, if we're speaking of a deceased person, or missing what is no longer a part of our lives. Um, while, so we're learning how to cope even while we feel the pain at the memory of the loss. All right, so those are my remarks about grief and loss. Now I wanted to switch gears a little bit and speak about signs of stress. But let me pause and just see if there are any comments. It doesn't look like, I don't think I've seen anything added to the chat, but I'll just pause and see if there's anything. Well, I guess not. We'll have a chance in just a few minutes to see if there are more remarks that people want to uh, uh, share with us. So let's take a look at these signs of stress. About a year ago, actually, our executive director, Tom Tamora, asked me to look into this. I don't know if you all have seen, there are many, many tip sheets there were last spring, and maybe some still enduring, about you know, how to deal with this time of the pandemic. And interesting, and so we have some at our own at the county health, not not us here at the crisis center, but at the what I mean is in our own county and the health department, and they've got some great websites and some great links. And so I went there, and then it led me to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and they actually had all of these different tip sheets already developed for a time of disaster. Uh, little did they know it would apply to this disaster. They had prepared it years ago for other disasters. But when there is communal, societal stress, or the, in the individual, what can we anticipate in terms of the mental health effects? So certainly there would be increased, and there is, and there has been, there still is, increased anger, increased arguments, increased conflict. And maybe you've seen this in your own interactions, uh, whether around and about in the community, in your own family situation, or whatever it is, whether in ourselves or in the other people around us, that a little bit or maybe a bit more than usual, a bit more anger, a bit more conflict. And maybe it was more intense a year ago than it is now. But I think there's still some of this happening due to the pandemic. So I, I've heard of people talk about, um, someone called it mask anger. And that is, you know, uh, there are some people who don't like, well, many, <laughs> who don't like wearing the mask. And that's uncomfortable for many. But also there are those who do wear the mask. And then when others are not wearing their mask, or when others are not wearing the mask correctly, or when others are a little too close then someone feels comfortable, then that individual becomes angry, angry at the other one. Anyway, so there's increased anger just specifically related to that. Sometimes it's not even as obvious that it's so directly, it doesn't appear to be directly related to COVID or masking, but just there's more tension. Next bullet point, increased agitation increased anxiety, increased depression, increased loneliness, certainly. I have certainly seen the increased anxiety uh, that we have our, our COVID stress support group and at least what people feel more comfortable sharing about or what drew them, the participants, is their own anxiety related to the virus. Uh, the, the uncertainty of life. Uh, and then another part where people struggle is that we've discovered, probably all of us have discovered this, is that different people 
have different levels of concern related to the virus. And so there are some who aren't worried about it. Now, maybe they could or should be worried about it by some people's definition, but they're not. And maybe we ourselves have a higher level. And so you go out and about in the community and different people have different levels of concern and observation and observance of social distancing and physical distancing. Anyway, and that can promote greater anxiety. Decreased resilience, decreased creativity for some people. Now, this time of COVID has called upon people to find new creative ways of dealing with life or interacting in the world. And so here we are on Zoom, and many people have found Zoom and Microsoft Teams and what is it, um, Ring Central and whatever, all of these different platforms. That's one way, but just new ways of interacting, new ways of going about business new ways of being clean. Uh, and yet, and for some though, it's difficult in a time of stress and certainly initially to be able to think creatively and to have that resilience in a time of stress. This next bullet point I find very helpful. Increased symptoms of past challenges. I remember reading in one of the tip sheets from the CDC about the effects of stress, of tremendous stress on young children. So let's say we're talking about a very young child who has progressed through the developmental stage and is no longer bedwetting. But then in a time of tremendous stress, that child might return to the behavior of bedwetting. And we, let's say we as a parent might think, oh, I thought he was over that or she was over that. But we can understand that a time of tremendous stress will affect any of us. And so, and different people manifest it differently. So the child might return to, let's just say, a previous behavior that they had outgrown. And, but that can also happen with anyone of any age, a young person, an adult. And so if someone had been struggling related to anxiety, well then this time will provoke and invoke and uh, call that anxiety forward more. If someone had been dealing with depression, then certainly now maybe more so. If someone had been dealing with how to monitor one's anger and how one responds and interacts, this time will challenge that more. And so some people may return, or if someone had been dealing with, let's say, had stopped smoking, now the stress, someone might return to that behavior. Or someone had been dealing with drinking alcohol or drug use previously, and then had entered into recovery, maybe there's more of a challenge. And they might, unfortunately, sadly, health-wise, return to some of those previous behaviors. So at least we can understand why that would happen in the lives of those around us or maybe even in our own lives. Let me go on. Symptoms of physical health challenges might emerge. Certainly we saw that already a stress response of headaches, stomach aches, back aches, whatever difficulties. Increased use of alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, even if not at a level of, of abuse, certainly increased use but certainly we have seen that, <laughs> increased eating. <laughs> uh, now, and then if you struggled before COVID, I was saying this, you could be struggling even more now. Yes, and therefore, it was so important a year ago, it's still important now, that if any of us were, or for anyone, who was getting support previously already, it is so important to remain connected or reconnect or reconnect to sources of support in a very difficult time. All right, let me go on. So of course, take care of, here we are with our usual tip sheet kind of items. Take care of your physical health. That's still important, eating, sleeping, exercise, personal hygiene. Connect with others, sometimes easier said than done. 
but obviously in new, different, creative ways. You know, I saw something recently is that uh, some people said, well, they wish that the phrasing hadn't been social distancing. Instead, perhaps more precisely, it would be physical distancing. Because some people really, the, the necessary thing is to have physical distancing for the sake of not passing on the virus. But it's not about socially being distant, it's only about physically being distant. Avoid excessive attention on the news, find ways to help others. And that's hard. There have been a number of people whose usual ways of helping have not been available to them. And even now, a lot of people in the last year have wanted to volunteer in various ways and not found easily ways to help. By the way, we've had here at the Crisis Center an increase in the number of people volunteering for whatever number of reasons. One of the reasons could well be that they're not able to volunteer in other ways, but we are grateful for people who want to come and help out. Ask for help for support and support for yourself. Certainly, I think that's kind of obvious. We know that. I like this. What might help regarding depression? That And again, if you can read this, I got these bullet points. There was a short article from the website helpguide.org, which is a great website. Lots of sort of self-help, mental health article related articles. Uh, so helpguide.org, they had a particularly an article about depression, dealing with depression during COVID. So find new ways to engage with others. I already mentioned that. But here, what I like to underscore, they talk about move beyond small talk. Share about yourself. Share about the challenges. And that you don't have to get fixed by the other people. And you don't have to fix the other people with whom you are interacting, at least not immediately. That's not what the goal here is in terms of finding new ways to engage with other people. It's simply engaging with what is on our minds and who we are and what we are dealing with. So then the next is talk to someone who has learned to listen without judging and be someone who is learning to listen without judging. Certainly, that's what our team of volunteers and staff uh, seek to learn those abilities uh, here in terms of answering the crisis line. But hopefully anyone can learn this uh, just in regular interaction out and about in our lives. What might help regarding anxiety? Again, another article from the helpguide.org. Uh, and so what do they say? Tips for dealing. This is hard. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But take action where you can. Take action over what you can control. Easier said than done sometimes. Here's something challenging. Challenge your need for certainty. There's a lot of unknown. There's, there has been over the past year, and there still is even now. Uh, what is known? How safely can we interact and to what degree? And our level of knowledge is always developing as a society. Work toward accepting uncertainty. Focus on the present, manage stress and anxiety, for example, through physical health efforts that a lot of people say very often that the physical, focusing on physical health in terms of sleeping and eating and exercise, besides just talking about these things, can be helpful. All right, well, I'm mindful of the time. Maybe what I'll do is pause. Here are some helpful traits of those trying to help <laughs> that I got from grief.com, another website. Uh, but maybe I'll stop sharing. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for inviting us to present uh, today and then again in May.